Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ingenious Talks Online, Detecting COVID-19 Through Cough Sounds. Thank you for joining us today. So my name is Laura Kilpatrick, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's event. Uh, we'll just get started with a few housekeeping items. So this is a Zoom webinar, which means all attendee videos and microphones have been disabled. However, you do have the option to ask a question by typing in the Q&A box on your screen. While questions will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation, we highly encourage you to type them as they come to mind into the Q&A box. So you do not need to wait until the question and answer period to submit your questions. Also, please be mindful that with the high volume of questions, we cannot guarantee that all will be answered. Um, today's webinar will be recorded and posted to Carlton's YouTube channel. You may also talk amongst each other by using the chat box on your screen. And finally, um, there will be an on-screen link at the conclusion of the webinar um, to a brief survey. So if you do have the time to fill that out, we would really appreciate that. We really value and um, appreciate your feedback. All answers are anonymous. So now I'm pleased to introduce to you our speaker, graduate student, Madison Cohen McFarlane. Madison is pursuing her PhD in biomedical engineering at Carleton University in the Department of Systems and Computer Engineering. She received her engineering degree um, in biomedical engineering from the University of Guelph in 2015 and a master's in biomedical engineering in, from Carleton University in 2017. Her research is in developing a system to monitor and track non-speech human sounds. For example, cough, sneeze, and snore. The system would be applicable to smart home monitoring of respiratory health conditions, including COVID-19, that are prevalent in the older adult population. The end goal would be to improve quality of life by supporting independent living of older adults at home. Today, Madison will discuss the development of what may be one of the first internationally available upon request database of COVID-19 cough events created by a team of researchers at Carleton University. She will review numerous individual cough events obtained through public media interviews with COVID-19 patients and explain how they can be analyzed through audio-based sensing methods that address the frequency, severity, and characteristics of the COVID-19 cough. Thank you, Madison, for joining us today. And now I hand it over to you. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everybody. My name is Madison Co. McFarland. I'm a PhD student at Carleton University um, under the supervision of Dr. Rafiq Gugron, the VP of research here at Carleton, and Dr. Frank Knopfel, a, a physician at Elizabeth Greer Hospital in Ottawa. I'm going to be presenting my research on detecting COVID through cough sounds. So I'm going to just take a little bit of a step back for everybody. And um, as many people know, the World Health Organization declared the novel coronavirus or COVID-19 on a, a pandemic on March 11th, 2020. As of October 16th, there have been 38,789,204 cases worldwide, which has led to 1,095,097 deaths. As everybody knows, um, with the race to find a vaccine, these numbers are still growing and contact tracing has become more and more relevant. I'm sure you've heard over the course of this pandemic period, uh, the most common symptoms of the initial phases of COVID-19 are fatigue, fever, and cough. And as a grad student that was researching cough as a marker for different respiratory conditions, I noticed that oh, this is interesting, maybe my research would be applicable. Um, so I'm just gonna take a moment and do a brief uh, experiment with everybody here, and we're gonna have a poll. I'm gonna play these three different cough sounds. I wanna know if you'd be able to spot the COVID cough. So this is the first one, <coughs> second one, <coughs> third one. <coughs> and I will play them again. <coughs> Second one <coughs> or third? <coughs> so let's see how you do. 
on that. Okay, those are some interesting results there. So I'm sure many people thought uh, have heard that the COVID-19 cough is dry in nature. And I'm gonna get into a little bit of the differentiation between a wet cough and a dry cough in a bit later in this presentation. But the 58% of us thought that option three was the COVID-19 cough. In reality, the COVID-19 cough was actually the second one. So it was this one. <coughs> So this sort of led into the idea that this differentiation between the dry cough and the wet cough wasn't quite as clear as we had initially thought it was, uh, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, all this being said, I'm going to take a step back and describe where I was at at the beginning of the pandemic and how I came up with the idea to create this uh, novel database of COVID coughs. So like many people, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was sent home and I was working from my office, which is also my kitchen and my living room. Um, and because the pandemic was this very crazy situation that I was in, of course, I was listening to all of the media attention and news articles about it. And one thing I noticed is that there was a lot of attention being given to uh, people who had had been diagnosed with COVID-19 um, being interviewed in a variety of different places. Of course, me being the, per, the researcher that I am, also noticed that during these interviews, a lot of these people were coughing. And I said, hey, I wonder if anybody has put together a COVID-19 cough database. And given the fact that clinical data acquisition is currently really unrealistic, so it's the idea of um, putting in some microphones in a hospital waiting room or one of the testing centers um, would just add more strain to our healthcare system right now in the midst of this pandemic and we're all trying to figure out our way out of it. Uh, the idea of using these coughs would be, uh, I will play those coughs again, Vincent, I promise. Once you get a little farther, they come up again later in the presentation, I promise, okay? Uh, the idea of using these uh, public media interviews as cough uh, database curation methods uh, took out this onus on the medical professionals to also give me and the research community more data. So the solution was the novel coronavirus cough database um, or no COCODA, which is my little term that I've been calling it because it's quite a mouth mouthful. Um, the main idea was that it's an interim solution for rapid algorithmic development of COVID-19 cough evaluation. Um, and will, that will then allow us to test it on more uh, in-depth and larger sample sizes in the future. Um, as Laura mentioned, uh, it's available for free to the research community upon request. And I've actually gotten a few requests thus far already. So back in April, when I was starting to create this database, um, I was able to sort of selectively decide what my search criteria were gonna be. And I had actually started looking in YouTube specifically. Um, so I, these were the seven search criteria that I used, all of which were searched at least twice in the, between April and June, 2020. This process is still ongoing and the no Kokoda version two is in the works. Um, but as of that point, I was able to find 13 individual public media interviews with uh, 10 different people um, who self-reported to having COVID-19. So I'm gonna bring um, your attention just as a sidebar here that one of the things with this database is obviously I'm relying on the fact that these news stations have indeed found people who were in, actually diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, all of the media sources I found were reputable sources, so I'm fairly confident that that is the case, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, so after I got all these news in interviews, um, I went through and manually segmented them. So for example, here for the coronavirus outbreak video, I was able to segment this cough, and as requested, here is the <coughs> COVID cough. And I'll play it again. <coughs> Um, so that was performed for all 13 in, uh, videos, which resulted in a total of 73 cough events in total. Our previous work has found that cough phase annotation can be really important for cough characteristic evaluation, specifically as to the identification of a wet cough versus a co uh, dry cough. 
Um, and so in addition to the uh, manual cough segmentation, we also per uh, performed a phase annotation. So coughs can be typically split into two or three parts. Uh, the first part is called the initial cough sound. The second part is the intermediate phase. And the third part is a secondary cough phase. Um, it's important, just as a sidebar, the, some coughs don't have the secondary cough sound associated with them. Um, and an example of that can be seen here in the bottom cough uh, visualization method. So the NoCoCoda database is a, in summary, 73 cough events from 10 individuals and 13 public media interviews is still growing um, in addition to phase annotations associated with each cough event. So I'm gonna take a bit of a step back here and talk about wet coughs versus dry coughs, okay? So the wet cough, again, sounds like this. <coughs> and the dry cough sounds like this, okay? So dry cough characteristics, typically a really good, like if you can think of a smoker's cough, that's typically what the dry coughs actually sound like. Um, and there's no mucus or sputum. There's nothing being forced out of the lungs. Um, I'm gonna bring your attention to the intermediate phase of the cough sound, which is right here, where the amplitude of the sound is quite low. Um, and then when I was able, when we take it into the frequency domain or the spectrogram representation, you can see here that there isn't that much bright spots going on within the period of the intermediate phase. Specifically, it was noted between dry and wet coughs over a larger sample size that there's lower energy, so more purple areas observed in the intermediate phase um, at higher frequencies for the dry coughs. So right here. In contrast, wet, wet coughs are typically uh, produced by foreign bodies that cause the accumulation of white blood cells, um, which then results in sputum or phlegm. So a really good example of that is if you have a cough, like the common cold, that's the kind of cough that you'll have with your lungs trying to actively get something out of, uh, out of your airway. Um, so in contrast to the dry cough, if we look at our intermediate phase here, we notice that there's a lot more amplitude variation going on. And it's even more obvious when we look at our frequency representation in the bottom here, where in the high area, there's a lot more energy or bright spots in the higher frequency ranges during that intermediate phase. So let's just like put these together for a comparative point. Um, again, so the dry cough, again, it sounds like this. And the wet cough sounds like this. And you can really clearly see that there is a very low amplitude in the intermediate phase compared to the wet cough. And again, when you have the two frequency representations side, side by side, it's even more obvious. So this led our research group to create the first feature that we use to evaluate coughs. Um, and I have been able to apply it to COVID, the COVID-19 coughs, and I'll show you those results shortly. So the first feature is called power ratio. So this was based on phase annotation. So the power for each cough sound was computed for the initial phase, the intermediate phase, and the secondary cough sounds. Um, and it results in a figure that looks like this. By observation between a larger sample of dry coughs and wet coughs, um, it was found that dry coughs had the highest peak in the um, normalized power um, between 1,000 and 2,500 hertz, so in this area right here. In contrast, for wet coughs, the highest peak was found between 0 and 750 hertz, which is found right here. In addition, just by observation, I'm sure most of, uh, many of you can tell that the dry cough has like not very much going on in the area where the wet cough highest peak is expected, but the wet cough has some things going on in the dry cough region. So in order to make these differences more pronounced, we created the power ratio. So the power ratio is just the sum of the power in the dry cough region of every cough divided by the sum of the power in the wet cough region, right here. So for example, for our dry cough, again, this one, we have a power ratio of about 17.5 compared to the wet cough, uh, here, where the power ratio is about 1.2, and it sounds like this again. 
So that sort of large difference between those two numbers is one of the features that we can use in apply to classification algorithms to differentiate between these two different types of costs. The second feature of interest that we've used, especially for the differentiation between dry and wet costs, is called the number of peaks in the energy envelope. So in order to create an energy envelope, you first have to uh, identify a particular region of interest on the frequency spectrum. And again, based on our previous work, we decided to use band pass filter the audio, audio costs between 200 and 250 hertz, as that was where we observed the biggest differences. Um, and that's the result. The result of that is can be seen in the amplitude on the top for both of the cost types. So as you can see here, in the intermediate phase, it's almost completely gone compared to the wet cost where there's a lot more going on. This signal was then squared so that we had no negative values, which results in these peaks and the peaks for the wet cost here. And then an energy envelope was created to find the uh, sort of the perimeter of this signal, resulting in this figure here for the dry cough and this figure here for the wet cough. So again, you can definitely see that the intermediate phase, there's very not very much going on for the dry cough, but there's a lot more going on for the wet cough. Finally, in order to come up with a, just a single number for this feature, we use peak detect detection algorithms to count the number of peaks in the en energy envelope. So for the dry cough, there was only two peaks found, and those can be those are associated with the initial cough sound and the secondary cough sound. However, for the wet cough, you can see here that there is a four peaks, one, two, three, and four. Um, and some of those peaks are actually found um, within the intermediate phase. So again, we have a two versus a four. So that was not quite as drastic as the power ratio in terms of the differentiation between the two different kinds of coughs, but it does show that there's a difference and that was consistent across a variety of different wet and dry cough sounds. So let's bring it back to the COVID coughs. So again, this one is a COVID cough and I've played it for you a few times, but I'll play it again. <coughs> and when you hear that, it actually kind of sounds wet like at least for me when I was listening to it. And that was what sort of brought me to the idea of investigating this COVID-19 cough as to if it is dry or if it is wet. I will premise all of this by saying the wet versus dry distinction is more of a sliding scale as opposed to a binary classification, wet or dry. Um, so it's a little harder to say this is actually wet and this is actually dry, but we're trying, that's effectively what we're trying to do right now. Um, so as I mentioned previously, the COVID-19 cough, um, is, the beginning of the disease is actually a dry cough. Um, it's, it's suspected and suggested by a few researchers that this is caused by a hypersensitivity reaction or a allergic reaction um, that's caused by the virus binding to the ACE2 uh, receptor on body cells. Um, this particular receptor has been shown to be associated with a chronic dry cough um, when individuals with health heart disease take what is called an ACE2 inhibition drug um, that causes this chronic dry cough without irritation. So it's potentially uh, the dry cough is associated with the same mechanism, but the research is still a little out on it. Um, however, it's possible. So we know that the dry cough is not productive and it's uh, involuntary. You just cough, it's not necessarily associated for, um, it's not necessarily associated with the uh, irritation of the throat necessarily. However, in more severe stages of the disease, the COVID cough can transition to be more wet-like in nature. Um, as the virus enters the lungs, uh, again, the white blood cells will accumulate there, it causes phlegm, and that is trying to be uh, ex ex uh, extracted from the lungs by that wet cough. Um, in addition, sometimes when people get severe cases of disease, they get a secondary condition um, called which something like pneumonia that can also have impact on breathing and respiratory um, patterns, uh, causing the cough to get even worse. So that's when the cough um, can become wet. So if we think back to the database that I had mentioned I was able to curate, a lot of the database um, was based on interviews with people either for like during a really severe case of the disease while they were in the hospital and coughing, or it was after the disease 
uh, abated. So they were talking about their experience being hospitalized with COVID-19. So based on this potential transition from the dry to wet cough, I, my, I suspected that a lot of the COVID-19 coughs that I was able to curate might actually be more wet in nature as opposed to dry. Um, so those two features I just described to you, everybody, um, was computed for the COVID-19 coughs and compared to a previous data set of ours of wet and dry coughs. And these were the results. Um, so as you can see here, our dry coughs are in the blue diamonds, our wet coughs are the red squares, and our COVID-19 coughs are the green circles. So I was happy to find out that my thought that the COVID-19 coughs that I was able to curate because they were at later stages of the disease in more severe cases, that a lot of them presented as more wet-like in nature as opposed to dry. Um, however, there were a few cases of people being interviewed who had COVID-19 um, prior to the disease getting bad or they weren't affected very much. And, it, uh, and that is shown here by these uh, sort of outliers of the COVID-19 cough that had higher power ratios um, compared to the majority of the uh, COVID-19 coughs, which have quite low power ratios that you can see along this axis. So this leads me to sort of where is this going to go? Um, right now I'm doing more data collection and I'm trying to find some coughs that show progression of disease. So I'm trying to find people that have been interviewed sort of at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end to see if these cough characteristics indeed actually shift from dry to wet over the course of the entire disease. Um, obviously, I'm not there yet. My database is still kind of small. Um, and I have no control over who gets interviewed and when. Uh, so we'll see. Maybe I'll be able to do that. So this is really cool, being able to detect COVID coughs or just coughs in general. But like, what could we do with it? Um, so I'm going to take a step back and talk a little bit about applications of uh, audio monitoring with respect to cough, um, which could be applicable to the COVID-19 cough or just any respiratory condition in general. So the first example of an application is smart home monitoring. Um, so I'm sure many people are familiar with this. Smart home monitoring has gotten lots of attention. You can control your thermostat, your lights, your TV, your security system, water pressure, temperature, and your appliances, as well as alarms like fire alarms. Um, and our research group has done a lot of work in uh, smart home monitoring, especially with bed-based monitoring in the past. Um, but the integration of an audio system, so microphone, um, that could already exist in your home, something like some of the smart home uh, hubs, uh, would allow for some additional information to be given to healthcare providers. So let's take the example of an older adult who's living at home and we're trying to support them living there um, in a comfortable way safely. So over the course of a month, uh, they might not notice that their cough is getting worse, but an algorithm, uh, automatic cough detection algorithm could tell you, oh, Mr. So-and-so coughed about two times a day at the beginning of the month, but then was coughing like 40 times a day at the end of the month. And that's a very drastic thing. Um, or Mr. So-and-so didn't really cough very much last month, but this month it's gotten quite severe um, in nature. So it was really forceful. So the system, depending on how you set it up, could give a notification to the user saying, hey, your cough sounds really uh, concerning. You should go visit a, a physician. Or in the case of an older adult, if there's a family member who's responsible for the care, uh, the notification could go to the family member saying, hey, your uh, dependent your, or your older parent or whatever may the relationship be um, has been coughing a lot and the respiratory condition that they already have been diagnosed with um, might be getting worse. So maybe you should take them to the doctor. The final option is if this smart home monitoring system was integrated in a clinical setting so that there was a direct connection from the smart home hub to a a physician or a medical professional, and that notification that the cough is worse, so the cough has increased in its number, um, can be sent directly to the physician so that that potentially medications can be adjusted. The second option is contact tracing. So let's just take a moment and imagine that we're in a busy train station. 
So there, as you heard in that sample, there's a lot of things going on. There's lots of conversations happening. There's the overhead speaker announcing that train, the train is coming. Um, but, I'm, but there's also a cough that was very near the end there. So in an ideal world, and I'd like to preface this example by saying there's lots of privacy concerns and other things that need to be addressed prior to the final implementation of this idea, but a system that has video monitoring in addition to some audio monitoring would allow for the audio um, to identify a particular sound, which audio processing can do, locate the location of that particular sound, um, and also then use the camera to evaluate who was around that area to flag the potential people that might have been introduced to a specific uh, talk. Uh, Again, this would also be kind of contingent on us finding a characteristic of the COVID-19 cough, um, or it would allow us to find someone who's coughing that we know has been diagnosed with COVID-19 or a future pandemic. All this being said, this particular example might not necessarily be applicable for COVID-19 as, uh, as a vaccine is, is in the works, um, but it could be really applicable to future pandemics if that happens. And the last example I kind of want to bring your attention to is medical waiting rooms. And again, this is tied into sort of the older adult experience as well as everyday use. But let's say you go to the doctor for a cough um, and you're in the waiting room and you're waiting, let's say, for 15 minutes. Um, and you're coughing, you're not really paying attention to it, but you go into the office and the doctor asks, how's your cough? How many times have you coughed? And they ask you to cough. So that's called a voluntary cough. Um, and there is some differences between a voluntary cough. So if I were to say, hey, can you cough right now? Um, versus if you're sick and you cough uh, because you feel the need to cough. So a system that is in a waiting room, room could identify who's coughing within the waiting room. And I count the number of times they coughed, the severity of the cough, and I'd also evaluate if there's any characteristics of interest that the physician should know about. So that way, the physician can get that information immediately, not have to rely on self-report measures, and then um, make a clinical decision based on that. Um, again, this one is also has some privacy concerns that need to be implemented prior to uh, its use, but it's a really exciting area, especially for their off waiting rooms that deal with the older adult population that could have dementia or Alzheimer's and can't remember how bad their cough was prior yesterday versus today or last week compared to this week. So for me and my research, what am I keep, what am I doing right now? Where is this going? Um, like I said, I'm collecting more data. Unfortunately, the pandemic is still a thing and a vaccine isn't something that we have as of yet. Um, but we are able to listen to a lot of interviews with people that have been diagnosed with COVID-19 um, and I'm still collecting data. Uh, I've mentioned two features of interest with respect to the wet and dry progression of the disease. Um, I'm looking into getting the data that will allow me to investigate that progression a little bit more deeply, um, as well as potentially implementing those features into more classical machine learning tools to automatically differentiate between the two different kinds of costs. And finally, um, I'm playing with the idea of using deep learning and AI-based classes methods that will automatically be able to differentiate or identify different characteristics of cough events that could be medically relevant for a physician. So if anybody is more interested, the um, Nocal Coda data Journal paper or the Novel Coronavirus Cough Database um, was published in August of 2020 and it's an open access journal and I think we're going to be giving everybody the link to that particular paper um, at the end of the talk. Um, and uh, if you're interested in sort of the wet versus dry feature differentiation, some of my colleagues previously published the extraction of the variations of those two different kinds of features that I've discussed today. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for your attention, um, and I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions. All right, thanks so much, Madison. That was very informative. Um, so to everyone in the audience, if you do have a question for Madison, um, you can type it into the Q&A box on your screen and we'll try and address it. Okay, first up, um, so how does a person's voice or gender affect their cough profiles? Is that's there a, a drastic good. difference? That's a, that's a really good question actually. Um, so gender doesn't necessarily have an impact on cough. It's actually the 
the the the, the length of your vocal, like your vocal tract or your respiratory tract, that has a bigger impact. So uh, one of the things that's quite hard is sometimes when you hear a female cough and a child's cough, it sounds really hard to differentiate just based on someone's ear. Uh, male coughs are easier to detect and identify as uh, male coughs because they're usually at a lower frequency range, which is the same with a, a female versus a male voice or a female voice versus a child's voice. So that uh, sort of phenomenon is consistent with the male coughs as well. Perfect. And just to follow up to that, so could this affect how your features are designed? Yeah, it can. It definitely can. Um, so everything, that's why we normalize the frequency ranges. Um, so that when you normalize a frequency, it's with respect to something in that sound already. So for example, if I have a cough and I'm normalizing it to the initial cough sound, it means that the intermediate phase and the secondary cough phase are all um, divided by the, the initial cough sound. So then it's a representation of that cough with respect to itself, irrespective of what the actual frequency level is. Wonderful, thank you. All right, next up, um, can wearing a mask affect the way the sound of the cough is interpreted? Yes, um, and without going into too many details, that's something I'm looking into right now. <laughs> Uh, typically, it sounds more muffled, which I'm sure you've been able to hear as well. If someone's wearing a mask or if they cough into their sleeve, uh, the cough characteristics are uh, harder to interpret. Is this aimed to be a diagnostic tool? No, <laughs> um, at least not in my opinion. I, I think at this point, in terms of the rapid algorithmic development and Sort of getting it to be helpful to the broader population. I think it needs to be a tool for medical professionals to be able to use uh, in their clinical decision making. Uh, eventually, maybe cough classification could be used um, as a diagnosis tool, but again, um, because coughs aren't incredibly distinct with respect to different health conditions, like a lot of respiratory condition coughs sound very similar. Um, I would be hesitant to say that it would be able to di diagnose anything 100%. Perfect, thank you. I know you touched a little bit on gender, um, but there's another question that asks if um, body size or age affect the characteristics of a cough. Yeah, it does. Um, so body size would definitely affect it. A uh, larger person would have a longer uh, respiratory tract and vocal tract, which would then have an impact on what the cough would sound like. Um, and I, I'm not entirely sure about age. I would suspect that there were some markers for age, um, mainly due to the fact that I'm sure everybody has heard sort of like an older person or their grandmother or grandfather coughing. And it's all, it, for, for me, in my experience, it always seemed a lot more severe um than a, a, a younger adult coughing but i haven't looked into that it's a good question thank you okay so are wet and dry coughs really that different uh, uh so as i mentioned sort of in passing there the wet and the dry coughs are uh it's more of a spectrum right so the smoker's cough can be considered a very dry cough it's very clear. And obviously the examples I gave you guys today of wet versus dry coughs are really sort of extreme examples so that it, you can hear it audibly. Um, but it's more of a spectrum. So is, I, I like to use the term, is a cough more wet-like or is it a cough more dry-like as the classification as opposed to it's wet or it's dry. Um, it's a particular tool that can give us more information about an underlying Okay, um, since there are many reasons for someone to cough, for example, allergies, the flu, wouldn't you need an extensive database for all of these in order to identify a COVID cough? Yeah, so again, the COVID cough, I'm not actually sure, I'm still looking into it. it if the COVID cough has any features that we can actually differentiate from every other kind of cough. However, um, there might be features that give us an indication that it is more likely to be a COVID cough. And at this point, um, 
I don't have a database of all coughs ever possible, obviously, because that would be amazing and uh, really unrealistic right now. But um, you can uh, do probability matrix to say, okay, this particular cough is very, very similar to the COVID coughs that I have seen in the past. It might be COVID, which is part of the reason why I would say that it can't really be a diagnostic tool because it would be an indication that someone should get tested as opposed to this is absolutely a COVID cough. Um, and again, the wet versus dry progression over the course of the disease is something that I think might give us some interesting results, especially for the um, COVID-19 COVID, uh, uh, COVID disease progression, because though a lot of some respiratory conditions can go from dry to wet, not very many do. So that's a, a unique feature. Right. So is your goal to identify markers that distinguish the early or dry COVID cough from other wet coughs, not COVID coughs? Ah, uh, yeah. So, so really, that's a good question. My research goal is to more, yeah, I'd love to be able to distinguish the COVID coughs from other wet coughs because as you saw in that graph, that's where the confusion was happening. Um, do I, I'm, but I'm not necessarily sure if COVID-19 cough is actually different from wet coughs or is actually different from dry coughs. I could play two different coughs. One is from a COVID patient, one is not from a COVID patient. Um, and they might sound exactly the same. So the differentiation between those two coughs, just looking at those two might not be possible. But um, looking at the disease progression of the COVID-19 cough versus the disease progression of a normal cough might give us some more information. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm still unsure exactly where the, the COVID-19 characteristics are going to take me. I'm still researching it. Now that I have the database, at least I can do that. Speaking of databases, what is your optimal minimum database size? Ah, uh, the more the better. <laughs> uh, for the preliminary investigations, uh, the current database is sufficient, but in order for me to make any statements or conclusions about the classification of costs or even just the classification of COVID costs, the database needs to be significantly bigger and with a lot more people. So as I mentioned, I was only able to find in that initial period uh, 10 individuals in 13 interviews. So it made it quite difficult to make any broad statements about COVID because it's such a small sample size. Uh, if I was to give you a number, I would say uh, if I had a database of COVID-19 cops that was like at least 200 right now, I would be thrilled. But again, it's such an early uh, new disease um, that data is really quite All right, so this one, um, this person has a comment. These are, the applications are absolutely great. However, do you see this is something that may be implemented in the near future? I'm yet to see actual systems implemented at scale. Um, for example, in homes to perform medical assessments. It appears there exists a ton of research, but very little implementation. Yeah, implementation is probably one of the biggest hurdles uh, of research in general, not just my own research. Um, I do know of a few uh, studies where we've implemented smart home monitoring systems in the homes of older adults um, with great success with our research group. Uh, however, it was prior to my cough research, so that wasn't included. Do I think that we're going to be able to get there before the end of the coronavirus? I'm not sure. I don't know if we're going to have any of these systems implemented um, for that. But I do think that it is somewhere and something that will become more and more common over the upcoming years. Um, and it would be a really helpful tool um, in future conditions. Like, let's say if another pandemic hit, but I really hope it doesn't, but it's possible that would be a really important tool. Um, yeah. Good question. Okay, I know you talked briefly on co-conditions, um, but here is another question. So first off, hi Madison, great talk. Do hi. you have thoughts about how to deal with the cases where people experience coughing related to smoking, so emphysema or COPD, or other pre-existing conditions on top of COVID-19 induced coughing? Um, 
Is that mm -hmm. something that your work addresses? We have not addressed that yet, but it is definitely something that I have uh, thought about and considered. Uh, with respect to like the underlying conditions, if somebody already has a chronic cough, cough might not necessarily be the best indicator for that person that COVID-19, uh, that they have COVID-19. Uh, I think uh, the cough characteristics could still be really important. So for example, if someone has an underlying smoker's cough um, and if they had a smartphone system, again, this would be a contingent on the application being uh, out there, uh, we could compare that original cough or that typical cough sound to the cough that they're experiencing now with respect to COVID-19. Um, and I would suspect that cough would change slightly in with multiple conditions. What about a mobile app so people could add their coughs with some indication that they were COVID positive? Yes, that's a good idea. There's actually a research group, I think it's out of Cambridge University, um, that's running that exact idea. So they've created an app that people can download and then cough into um, for their creation of their own database. Uh, and I, that's really exciting. Their database is going to be huge. Um, I don't have access to it, uh, but it, it's really exciting. The only caveat I would say for having a recording versus uh, getting report uh, coughs from interviews is that there is a potential difference between uh, a reflex cough, so a cough that someone has while they're talking, um, and it's involuntary, they're not expecting it, and a cough when we say, hey, here's your phone, can you cough into your phone? Um, I can't say for sure that there's going to be a difference between those two talks that are going to impact the cost evaluation, uh, but it's something to consider as that for that mechanism. Okay. The AI integration tool you mentioned is interesting. Can you speak a little more about that? Okay. Uh, so classical machine learning methods typically rely on uh, us as humans feeding it features. So the two features I talked about, um, I would give the machine learning, so an example, a linear discriminant, discriminant analysis, uh, the feature one, so that was the uh, power ratio, and feature two, which was the number of peaks. And then it would be able to make a, a, a guess as to what, uh, if one was wet or one was dry. Um, so typically, if you imagine that graph, there's like it, it pretty much plots a line between the two cases. And up above this line, it's wet cough, and below this line, it's dry cough. That's typically how it works. But in deep learning and AI, um, you actually feed the raw signals into these learning algorithms. So uh, it's they create their own features based on um, the deep learning tools uh, identifying differences between the two categories. So you feed it a, a group of wet coughs and a group of dry, dry coughs, or you feed it um, cats versus dogs. So it's a similar idea, and then it makes its own decisions. Perfect, thank you. Um, if a vaccine is found soon, does this encourage you to continue this research? That's a good question, yeah. Um, so, yes, it does. Uh, prior to co the pandemic happening, I was actually doing this research uh, for co cost classification and evaluation um, for the purposes of long-term monitoring uh, of smart homes. Um, and there's a variety of smart, uh, like respiratory conditions where cough is a, a clinical indicator of a worsening condition. Um, and that's what I was working on prior to the, co the pandemic. Now that the pandemic has uh, sort of shown me that there's a very current uh, end goal for my research, I guess, uh, it's made me realize that the end long-term applications might be even bigger than I had initially thought, uh, which has been really exciting for me to do that. So I do think that the cost classification in general and evaluation tools as an assistive uh, device or method for physicians to make clinical decisions um, would actually be beneficial, irrespective of the coronavirus being uh, cured, which I hope it is. Nick. Excellent. So I think that is all of our questions. If there are any more, please don't hesitate to enter them into the Q&A box.
Um, I will share right now. So Madison mentioned a few links. Um, so those are just up in the chat box right now if you want to check either of those out. Um, yeah, I don't think we have any more questions, Madison. Um, I just wanted to thank you so much for your presentation today. It was so informative and we just really thank you for your time. Thank you. It was great to be here. Great. Excellent. Okay. Um, so to everyone, I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time to join us today. And we really hope that you enjoyed the conversation and gained some valuable insight and information. Um, so this webinar will be posted to Carlton's YouTube channel um, following the event, um, if you want to check that out. I'm also just going to share this. So this has other ways that you can stay connected um, with the Faculty of Engineering and Design uh, to our website as well as social media. And um, our next talk, as you can see, is on November the 13th. Um, with Dr. Omir Shafiq discussing enhancing student learning experience through or using LMS analytics amid and post COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so thank you once again for your time. Um, once this webinar concludes, uh, there will be a link to a brief survey that appears on your screen. If you can click it and fill that out, uh, we'd very much appreciate that. And just remember that all um, answers are anonymous. So thank you once again, stay safe, and we hope to see you on November the 13th.